This is The Water Table. A chance to hear the agricultural side of these issues. A place for people to go find information and education. Water management is just going to become even more critical into the future. How misunderstood what we do is. I would encourage people to open their minds and listen to this dialogue. Welcome back to the Water Table Podcast. Uh, this next episode with Vinayak Shetakar of the Ohio State University. Um, Vinayak is a specialist in egg water management and hydrology. And Trey Ellis, again, an application engineer with Prinsco, uh, interviewed Vinayak. And they just had, had a really action-packed, uh, fun conversation um, I'm honored to say, Vinayak, you said something about a dream come true to be on my podcast. Um, I would love to interview you again in the future because I heard just a lot of great things about what you guys talked about, and I think you'll enjoy this episode. But uh, they talked a lot about drainage and, and what a conservation perspective when talking about water management changes and the conversation of drainage from a res- results-based perspective to prepare for an unpredictable future um, was something that that you're going to find interesting in here. Also, Vinayak just talked about how drainage sits in a perfect position to affect water quality and soil health research and rearrange the thinking around water management, which is exactly what we're trying to do here at the water table and just educate people on what drainage water management really is. Um, They also talked about the fact that we are seeing a need for water management as a way to simply sustain yields in a lot of cases. Agriculture is now a game of information and acting on what we know. Uh, Talk about that kind of thing a lot in in our podcast, but information is power, and uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode with Vinayak and Trey Ellis. Thanks for joining the Water Table. Well, welcome back to the Water Table Podcast. My name is Trey Ellis, uh, application engineer with Prinsco, and I'm joined here today at the North American Conservation and Drainage Expo uh, with Dr. Vinayak Shadecker, uh, assistant professor at the Ohio State University. <laughs> did, did I get that right? At least the university part right? <laughs> so welcome on. Th- thanks for joining us um, here at the show today. And uh, maybe just kind of walk through a little bit uh, background about yourself, you know, where uh Where's your education lie, and uh, you know how did you kind of get to get to where you are now? Sure, absolutely, Trey. Thank you, thank you for having me on the podcast. This is like dream come true for me. Like you know, it's it's um, I've been following the podcast, and it's just amazing. I, I never thought I would be here on this podium to talking about stuff. So anyway, a uh, little bit about me. Uh, um, I grew up in India. Did my uh, undergrad and masters uh, in ag engineering back in India. Uh, came here uh, to U.S. for a PhD in. Uh, uh, Ag engineering, uh, working on hydrology, ag water management, and then uh, kind of uh, continue to work on uh, aspects that are more hydrology, water quality, ag water management. Uh, slowly got into the soil health uh, side of things as well. So uh, a majority of my current work is kind of at the intersection of um, um, soil health, sustainable ag, and water management. Uh, of course, water quality is part of it. Uh, so, as you mentioned, I'm currently uh, uh, assistant professor of ag water management. So, I have the responsibility of being a state specialist for ag water management in Ohio. Uh, we do a lot of uh, extension work as part of that uh, responsibility. We conduct training programs and uh, also do small events and consultations that are mainly focused on water management, water quality, hydrology, uh, and things like that. Yeah. So. First question I got for you. Um, I've never been to Ohio. Uh, been around, you know, Iowa, Minnesota, uh, Dakotas a little bit. Uh, just kind of curious, maybe from your perspective, because I assume you've been to all those places as well. Um, you know, is kind of Ohio cookie cutter kind of the same thing from a from a drainage water management standpoint, or do you guys got anything unique going on over there that's different than some of the other states? Sure. Uh, let's let's talk about what what the what the current systems are. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in the Midwest. Uh, majority of our cropland does need drainage. You can't sustain crop production without drainage. That's the fact. Uh, what is different compared to you know North Dakotas or Minnesotas? Probably the water balance. Uh, we get about 40 inches of water here in Ohio. Um, about uh, half of that goes back right into the atmosphere as evapotranspiration. Uh, 
um, when it comes to the drainage systems, uh, we're talking about about 10 to 12 inches of water leaving the tile outlets uh, from those drainage systems. Uh, the funny part is, uh, no matter how much you're draining, drainage does have very similar impacts on uh, are the benefits to your crop production. So the purpose is still the same. The purpose is we're doing uh, drainage to number one, provide us trafficable conditions. Number two, drainage does have benefits to crop growth. And that's that's true in case of Ohio. A majority of our drained landscapes are in Northwest Ohio. Uh, mostly the glacial till soils that we have, uh, very poorly drained soils. As you go further south, uh, especially the uh, the river corridors tend to have more um, well-drained soils that don't necessarily need drainage. Uh, but you see drainage pretty much all over the state. Um, majority of it is in the in the uh, grain-producing ag land, you know, corn and soybean type of system. Right. And that's what I was going to ask. A lot of corn soybean rotation for the most part uh, throughout there. And um, yeah. And one more interesting thing I'll I'll tell you, Trey. Uh, what I'm seeing is, uh, you know, soil health movement has kind of fueled adoption of cover crops and <laughs> I see a lot of farmers wanting to get better drainage so they can establish their cover crops as well so that's another factor it's not a lot not a huge landscape but there is I know at least a few farmers who uh, are thinking of drainage from that perspective so. yeah absolutely um, and th that's what I've heard some of that same stuff uh, to up here you know that's that's uh proper soil health, soil drainage, stuff like that, you know, it, it, it benefits what's growing there. It doesn't only benefit the corn and soybeans or, or you know, what it's it's whatever's um, up there. I mean, from my understanding, I think all crops benefit from it. Right, yeah. The, the benefit to crop comes from the improvement in the soil. Mm -hmm. So what drainage does is it essentially uh, transforms the soil into a better soil, uh, improves a lot of physical properties, improves your nutrient efficiencies, uh, so there is a, a list of 20 benefits of drainage. Um, uh, one of my predecessors wrote that when in the year that I was born, so <laughs> in eight, 1982, Mel Palmer wrote an article, and I have it on my website. Uh, um, we kind of highlighted that article, and there's like 20 benefits of drainage. And if you go through the list, all those benefits are still valid, and there is some more now. So <laughs> Sure. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, hopefully we can get a link or like you're saying, maybe we can toss in some slides here uh, to, to show some of that. Um, yeah, great historical information on, on some of that stuff. Um, you mentioned cover crops as, as some of the, the uh, best management practices for, um, I guess, for soil health and, you know, that crossover um, into drainage. And just kind of curious, what else, what else, what other tools are in the toolbox for um, I guess, benefits on the landscape from an agronomic standpoint? Absolutely. And, um I'm going to talk about Ohio primarily because of my, most of my work is in Ohio, but I'm mm -hmm. also going to tell you that a lot of the practices that we're looking at in Ohio are very much the practices applicable anywhere in the Midwest area. So we do have regional collaborations where we're also exploring those same practices at, uh, at the regional scales. So I'm going to start off on the ag water management side, the water management drainage. So uh, drainage now the the conventional drainage that we've been teaching for let's say contractors to uh, design drainage systems uh, we're asking to keep a conservation drainage mindset when you're designing these systems uh, and then the concept of conservation drainage kind of includes a lot of these practices that relate to drainage or water management uh, just to name a few, uh, control drainage or drainage water management is a, is a very well-known practice. You guys have talked about that um, a lot of times. Uh, that's a practice that we're, we're uh, Ohio was one of the first few states to kind of initiate that research. So we have research that goes back 25, 30 years when uh, they just started exploring what the possibilities are with control drainage. Uh, my predecessors, you know, Norm Fauci, Larry Brown, uh, they did a lot of research on these uh, on this practice. A lot of good data came out of this. Uh, the, the state of Ohio then helped with the adoption of the practice. What I'm working on is more uh, smart ways of controlling the drainage. Uh, we have more automated systems coming up, uh, smart drainage systems coming up, and we're looking at automated control structures. Uh, and what their potential could be in the landscapes uh, compared to 
the conventional manual control structures. So that's something new we're talking about. Uh, we're also looking at how you can pair up control drainage with other practices. Uh, for example, you can use the control structures um, for sub-irrigation type of a system where you are putting water back into that structure that goes back in the field uh, to provide the, the irrigation benefit. Uh, we're also looking at, well, where is the water going to come from? So we're thinking, well, maybe we can in, um, install a recycling system, uh, collect the drainage water, especially during the months when we don't need it, collect it, store it, and recycle it back into the system uh, for irrigation or any other purpose. So those are some of the water management practices we're working on. We're also looking uh, very deep into how you can uh, manage the water quality issues and uh, drainage sits at the, uh, the perfect you know, perfect position for helping solve some of those issues. So we are pairing up our water management practices with some of the treatment type of practices. For example, wood chip bioreactors for nitrogen, uh, phosphorus removal structures or phosphorus filters for phosphorus and so on. There is uh, a lot of good uh, practices that we're looking at. Saturated buffers is a really good practice that you can, it's an ideal example of water management combined with treatment. Uh, so that's another system we're looking at. Um, something different that I'm doing which is uh, not in the arena of water management is I'm looking at the connection between uh, soil health and water quality. So how does improving soil health uh, affect the water quality coming out of that field? whether it's tile drainage or surface runoff. So we're exploring a lot on on the nexus between the sustainable ag, soil health, and water quality. Yeah, definitely. And that, that's kind of where my head goes a little bit too. Like you mentioned, there's, uh, you know, control drainage. That's, you know, not a new concept. Um, that's been around for a little while. And, and some of these... Um, treatment practices, the saturated buffers, the uh, bioreactors, which we have information on our water table website um, for a lot of those that people can check out on, you know, just a brief highlight on some of that. But, you know, getting more into the details, uh, or not to the details, but getting more, uh, maybe taking a step back and looking at how do these systems all need to work together or, you know, how do you pair in some of those things, um, you know, that you're looking into to get the benefits of properly managing your water for what you're growing on top of it so you can stay profitable, um, but then not impact anything downstream or, you know, as, as minimal impact downstream. And that's um, really encouraging to see or to, to hear that we we got more steam going on that. Or I hope there's more steam going on that. There that, is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, yeah, we're uh, essentially we're at a stage where we're, we want to demonstrate these practices, but the farmers, some farmers have, they're way ahead of us. They have recognized the benefit of irrigation uh, to some extent and then um, uh, there is some adoption of irrigation systems even in northwest Ohio which is kind of unconventional uh, nowadays so. yeah no and that, that's a uh that's good to hear that too. And, and that was another, I guess, question that um, it's kind of the million dollar question is how do you scale up this stuff? Like I said, they're not necessarily new practices. Um, and that's, you know, the, I think kind of where we're at now within the, the industry is, you know, either the scaling factor or uh, I guess the feasibility or, you know, linking that implementation um, aspect to some of this. So I don't know, maybe that's something that you guys are, are holding under the cloak at Ohio State that that you're just waiting to release now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. Uh, well, it's been the history so far that our uh, our research is uh, a few years ahead of the adoption that happens, and there is a reason for that. You need a lot of data uh, from all different uh, types of variables to kind of prove that the practice works. Uh, one of the uh, hurdles in getting the adoption of that practice is the fact that the farmer or the landowner has to be convinced that okay this is going to do something for me or the environment mm -hmm. and there's a couple ways to get that uh, convincing done uh, for the environment you know a lot of funding agencies uh, our uh, government agencies are investing incentivizing practices uh, but then practices like controlled drainage uh, they sell themselves if the farmers see the, the yield benefit and the economics behind it. So what we're trying to uh, constantly update our data, uh, conduct long-term studies so that we can confidently come to the conclusions in terms of okay, what are the economic benefits we're talking about when it comes to this practice and so on. So some of these newer practices, uh, especially drainage water recycling, is going to take some time for us to kind of 
have the conclusive numbers uh, to present to the farmers. But uh, as I said, you know, uh, it's looking very promising uh, in terms of the, the benefits of those practices. Right. Yeah, and that, that's something that's also kind of encouraging just hearing you speak through it a little bit more and, and thinking back to, you know, how does how do you gain steam on some of this stuff? And I think kind of where we're at now within, you know, not just, you know, taking a step back from agriculture, water management, stuff like that, but, you know, information is just that much more available to people. And I think that's going to eventually get trickled down into the egg sector even more. It already has, but, you know, that will start to keep growing that, um, you know, available information uh, for everybody to be able to make those better choices, uh, make those better decisions. So if it's backed up by the numbers um, that you guys are working on, that's going to be even better for, um, you know, having those pieces in place for when when that does all come to fruition. Uh, another, uh, I guess, maybe not a question, but uh, something else I want to hear you talk about a little bit is uh, at the last, uh, last summer, there was an international drainage symposium, and uh, we had the International Drainage Hall of Fame induction ceremony. So I don't know if too many people know that there's a, a drainage hall of fame, but there is one out there, and it's um, at, um, at Ohio State University. So um, in, inducted Charlie Schaefer uh, with Agri Jane and Dan James. Um, for his work, I believe, with NRCS or the ARS um, on some of that work. So maybe talk a little bit about the the Drainage Hall of Fame and what uh, you know, how you got involved in that and and, and what is going on today. So uh, as I mentioned, as part of my position, uh, I also got the responsibility to lead the uh, the Drainage Hall of Fame. Um, it's not as uh, glorious or as big as uh, the NFL Hall of Fame or any other Hall of Fames, but. Uh, apparently, Columbus is home to like 25 different Hall of Fame, uh, and Drainage Hall of Fame is one of Drainage them. Drainage is one of them. That's yeah. all right. So, uh, <laughs> so to uh, just to share some history with you, uh, this was started uh, in 1979. Uh, Glenn Schwab, Professor Glenn Schwab, who was uh, my predecessor, a very well-known uh, uh, drainage expert, he uh, came up with the idea of you know. Uh, this Drainage Hall of Fame and it's an international award so it's kind of coming up with an international award for outstanding achievements or contributions to the field of drainage and what he uh, visioned out was the award can be made to anyone who has made significant contributions towards not just research could be a teacher could be a extension educator could be a uh, educator for um, uh, non-traditional audiences and so on and could be an industry person and that's what if you go to through the list of inductees we have had so far uh, that shows that diversity so um, going back to 1979 when the first Hall of Fame was awarded to Do Dr. Don Kirkham uh, who is again well-known name uh, in the drainage, drainage research the fourth person to get awarded uh, inducted was Fred Galehouse, who is a drainage contractor from Ohio. And then more recently, you saw Charlie Schaefer, who uh, represents the industry, Agri-Drain. He has done outstanding work in terms of providing the leadership uh, to the water management um, aspects and really bringing people together. Um, and then Dr. Dan Jaynes, who worked for USDA ARS and did a lot of uh, outstanding research uh, towards uh, on uh, saturated buffers. He was a member of the Gulf of Hypoxia uh, task force, uh, came up with a lot of those initial recommendations and targets and so on. So uh, last year, as you mentioned, we uh, conducted the, the induction ceremony uh, here in Des Moines, where we're at. Uh, and uh, since 1979, we have inducted 27 people into this, uh, into this uh, Hall of Fame. So uh, if people are interested, you know, we again, we can provide you a link and uh, we can put it up on the podcast uh, website uh, for people to see who has been inducted. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a ongoing process. We're constantly accepting nominations and there is a committee that reviews the nominations. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a really great award and it's a great honor for people to be in that Hall of Fame. Right. Yeah. It's it's a really niche uh, niche industry, I guess, and, and a niche uh, niche Hall of Fame as well. But hey, that's uh, th those of us, those of us that are involved in it um, appreciate that that recognition. That I know that uh, ceremony that we had with with those two um, was was really good, Re really good ceremony, and, and I know that they really uh, appreciated it as well. Um, and maybe tailoring off of that is, uh, I remember in Charlie's speech, one of the things that he was uh, kind of building up and, and starting to 
gain more grasp on is the automation of those control structures that um, you're talking about too. And, and I think he gave a, a good analogy of adaptive cruise control that's going on in cars now where um, you know, you're know you on your cruise control and you're going 70 miles an hour, the car ahead of you is going 65. It's gonna slow down to know that you know it doesn't need to go 70 because you're gonna get in trouble. So he was making that analogy to control drainage is the automation process of that. Um, you know, to, that's going to be a key with these practices taken off. And you said you've been doing um, some of the research in that realm too. So maybe share with us a little bit of what uh, what you're finding on the automation side of, of control drainage. Yeah. So the yeah the main um, reason behind that is uh, for the last hundred years or more, we have thought about drainage as a passive system. You install it, forget about it. You know, it's just <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> you know, it's working and uh, you don't really think about managing that system. With control drainage structures being there, you have the ability to manage it. And you might ask, well, why would you even think about managing it? Many reasons. Uh, we did a, a, a regional analysis based on all the studies that have been done on drainage water management across the Midwest. We came together, uh, analyzed the data, and then um, came to a conclusion that, number one, control drainage, only control drainage, has some uh, water conservation benefits that translate into yield benefit, okay? But that wasn't throughout the, like all the years, all the sites. Uh, it was only somewhere around like 20 out of the 55 site years uh, is when we that saw benefit. that clear benefit, mm -hmm. okay? There were 12 out of that 55 or so where we didn't really see much difference between the, like just the control drainage uh, versus a free draining outlet. Said, okay, that's fine. But then what caught our attention was about six to 10 years, site years, where we actually saw a negative impact. So control drainage ended up negatively affecting the crop yields. And, why, and then we, we started wondering why that's happening. So uh, when you take a deep dive into the data that shows those were the years where we had, majority of those years, we had a lot of rainfall during the growing season and it ended up being the case that we had excess moisture stress on those crops. Those are the years when you actually want to manage your structures more actively. So that's kind of the thought process behind it. Uh, the other challenge that we're going to get in the, in the future is the erratic weather patterns. Uh, we're getting more and more intense rain events, bigger and bigger storms, uh, three, four inch storms, which means that you can't just rely on a free draining outlet or a control structure. You gotta think proactively. If I'm gonna, if I'm expecting a couple inches of rainfall, maybe I need to drain my already um, controlled field, create storage so I can soak up or I can at least minimize the impact of that storm by creating storage in my soil. So maybe you can think about adjusting the outlets in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another benefit to it. So there is many benefits that come to uh, this, but imagine having, being a farmer, managing 5,000 acres and having to manage 25, 30 control structures. Are you, gonna, are you gonna go and pull boards up or put boards down at every structure every couple of weeks? That's practically, impossible uh, maybe it's possible but it's very time consuming so that's where automation comes in that's where the smart uh, water management concept comes in uh, if, if, imagine if you had a system that can give you uh, kind of a recommendation based on the weather forecast it's um, using maybe artificial intelligence to kind of come up with the recommendation it comes on your phone app and then you with a click of a button you are able to manage those 25 30 structures that you may have so there is a lot of uh, benefits that you can think of and then what we're talking about, water management is not separate for a farmer. It's part of his farming operation or her, their farming operation. The rest of the farming operation, if you look at, in the last five or ten years, it has, it has gotten more into digital agriculture type of a, uh, technology uh, advancement. Everything, every system is connected, a lot of data being collected, being sent to the cloud and being analyzed. 
so i think water management needs to be part of that digital agriculture solution as well so that's another reason why we're thinking well maybe we need to do a lot more research and then bring our system so that everything can be connected on a farm and your tile outlet doesn't need to be disconnected from your from your network right yeah no and that's a good point um you know linking it to where the data is and i'm just trying to think back on <clears throat> on my parents farm is you know there's just a whole lot of hand-drawn tile maps um that are sitting out everywhere so you know that's uh um i think it the water part the water part of the equation on a lot of this stuff you know is is, is forgotten a lot you know it's a lot of year yield monitors and and corn hybrids and stuff like that where you know tying in the the water part of it as critical as it is to the whole system um you know i think that's something that that does get forgotten and there is two parts to it you know you you do the research but the the main thing is you got to be able to um, uh, educate people with what you find and um so that's what uh, i left one small, uh, one big detail out of my job uh, for the last uh, section of this because I wanted to uh, kind of talk about it more. Uh, we train, we train people who want to design and install systems. Uh, so we conduct training schools. Uh, so at Ohio State, we conduct uh, what we call overhauled drainage school. It's been probably one of the longest running drainage schools uh, in the country, um, more than 60 years now. So I recently got to lead the drainage schools, but it's been going on for a while. And this is what we do. We're constantly updating our curriculum to reflect these, uh, this modern thinking of designing systems and at the same time stressing the need for quality construction, quality installation. So, uh, so overhaul drainage schools is something that we uh, conduct every year. It's a five-day training program. And we get drainage contractors, farmers who want to do their own drainage, a um, lot of agency folks, uh, anyone who is interested. Sometimes uh, we get college students uh, who are just, you know, farm kids who came to the college and they want to learn more. They come and uh, learn from our drainage schools. Yeah. Um, and I think we'll, we'll definitely have a link to that within um, especially the event side of our, our page on the water table. But And I'm not sure exactly when this is going to air, but when's the school? Do you have it set here for the coming so, year? So uh, this year we're going to be... Um, in Worcester, Ohio, the school is going to be March 13th through 17th. So the spring break of Ohio State is when we usually do it. Uh, Those poor farm kids have to stick around and learn about drainage instead of <laughs> going out on spring break, huh? <laughs> so, oh, and that's the that's the interesting thing that I usually get four or five students who don't go on spring break and they're there learning drainage. So, uh, you know, I like them already. Yes, <laughs> they're more hardworking, to be honest. Um, I don't have a reference point. I have always taught in a college of ag, but I, I just feel like, uh, just based on my interaction, I feel like the uh, students who come with a, some of some farm background, they're always hardworking. They're serious about learning. And sure. So that helps. Yeah, I, I guess I would have to echo that too with uh, you know some of the career fairs and whatnot that we go to as well. Um, seeing some of those same same concepts um, through that too. But uh, mentioning in, in your work with students. Uh, we were talking before that you have taught a little bit in the past and then also, like I said, through the drainage school and teaching and whatnot, you know, what has been your messaging to some of the younger students that are coming through, um, some of the college kids that, um, it, you know, looking back at, at myself coming through college is I always thought about agricultural engineering and, and there's only a handful of schools, I guess, in the country, but let alone the Midwest, so, you know, there's kind of few and far uh, to pick from. So, um and especially even getting more niche into that is within the drainage water management sphere too. So um, being in your seat and having the influence uh, teaching some of these classes and leading some of these kids, what uh, what has been your messaging to them? So there's two, um, two things here. Uh, when I was teaching classes, I always made it clear to my students. I said, I've been through classes. I know you're not going to learn every lecture I give you, but here is this one single message that I want you to learn and remember for the rest of your life. So that was very clear, and then again, uh, even with the, the students, what we really try to um, um, teach, educate them on is the need for an integrated water management approach, uh, a farm scale water management approach. Don't just look at one field and think about having to drain or irrigate that field. Uh, you should be thinking about a system. So kind of trying to explain to them and teach them how you um, uh, how you can uh, take a systems approach and then do the management part for water management part as part of that system and that you know 
when they when they kind of get that message then that relates to your not just boosting the crop yields but also maximizing the crop so that's on the farm side but a lot of these students especially ag, ag engineering students i i i believe ag, an ag engineer can do anything in this world any field they can go into computer sciences they can go to nasa they can you know do ag they can do whatever you know um, because they're good learners uh, anyway that's just a bias because i'm an ag engineer <laughs> exactly there we go uh, i agree <laughs> but uh, as i said you know non-ag or non-traditional uh, workplaces they, they gotta be able to apply what they learn and a lot of times we we give them skills rather than the knowledge um, to kind of do more critical thinking problem solving uh, so skill development is part of it and the other thing i always make sure uh, is to make sure you know uh, they're aware of where to find information it's okay if you forget about it but if you know where to go and find the information then you're good and then one uh, common source of information is the land grant institutions and the extension system so uh, we try to try to give them these uh, at least introduce them to some of these existing systems and then the second part of that is <coughs> bringing people on board who are already practitioners so i always invite engineers who are actively designing projects uh, we bring in people from industry and have them talk to the students rather than us teaching them and that kind of gives them just at least a, a, a window into the future or at least what's going on in the practice and that really helps a lot of students to kind of uh, find that uh, interest uh, in what they want to do in future yeah, absolutely, and that's that's the <clears throat> classes that I appreciated the most is bringing in, you know, some out outside perspectives on some of that. So, um, been fortunate enough to be able to lend that industry uh, insight into some of those classes, and it's always been appreciated. And uh, like you said, it might not be, it's not going to fit everybody um, for some of the stuff that we're talking about. But every now and then, there's there's a few kids that their eyes light up a little bit, and like, ooh, hey, water and drainage and stuff. So, um, no, it's it's that I have taught, like now they are my colleagues, they are, they are my collaborators. I work with a, a student that was just an undergrad, I was a TA for that class and now uh, he, he does uh, a lot of the conservation practice implementation in the state of Ohio. So you never know who would end up where and uh, end up working with you. Exactly. Maybe lo looking at uh, wrapping us up a little bit, um, we talked a lot about a lot about um, you know different practices and you know some of that systems approach and some of the things that um, is going on with the research side and then you know looking at the future with some of these kids um, coming up too that like I said you're, you're teaching you're mentoring that that are coming up um, you know where do you see the the future of uh, drainage and water management you know from your seat um, and you've had a handful of different seats at the college too you know what uh, where do you see that route going um, for the industry well for the industry one thing I can say is um, uh, our industry is going kind of hand in hand with what we're doing in the research um, a lot of times uh, our research is informed and driven by what the need is on the ground whether it that need comes from the farmer groups or the industry groups. And just as an example, again, the automated control drainage systems, you know, there is a lot that we need to uh, uh, explore further and develop prescriptions for uh, when it comes to that, that type of management. So uh, I, think, I think looking at the future of water management, uh, people tend to think, well, maybe we're running out of ground to drain in the Midwest. And maybe we will someday, who knows, uh, but we'll always have retrofit jobs. But more importantly, I think the future of the, this whole field is in management of the water. Managing that water and not just managing it um, any way you think, managing, using a smart approach, using an informed approach would be the future whether that comes from your sensor technology integration ai machine learning there is all kinds of fancy terms that you can add on top of that future but i think managing water has been the key not just for crop production boosting crop production but now we're getting into a situation where in considering the future climate scenarios uh, we're looking at needing to manage water 
so that you can even sustain the existing crop production forget about increasing crop yields. and the other side of that is the environmental impacts and managing for minimizing the environmental impacts so uh, so that's kind of the theme that i'm going with you know if you talk to other faculty or other researchers everybody's gonna come up with their own thing but i'm hoping i'm just getting started with my job so um, uh, if you ask Vinayak what Vinayak is going to work on for the next 15 years or whatever, I think that would be the, the theme that I'm thinking. I'm going to work on managing water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely don't disagree with a lot of that. Um, but like you mentioned, there's a lot of a lot of pieces to play in there. At, you know, and, and looking down the barrel of it a little bit, it's, uh, like I said, a lot of pieces have to come into play. A lot of things got to work out right. Uh, a lot of old tile maps that need to get retrofitted and, and put into uh, some meaningful data. So so you smart guys are be able to, to take a look at that and pull something meaningful from it. Um, and that just kind of gets, uh, I guess, where my thinking is, you know, with, with all that stuff, all that work ahead of us, you know, I'm, call me a skeptic. I'm a little bit skeptical on having all that fit in perfect. I think it'd be great if it did. Um, but that being said too, I know my dad especially was uh, a skeptic on auto steer right away w within um, within all of our machinery and whatnot. And and granny had still good to, to get out in some of the old cabless tractors and and do some work. But uh, if you're if you're serious about uh, hammering down and getting something done, um, you know you kind of you can't not anymore. Um, and that's just one small uh, piece of technology with that. So. Um, Appreciate the time uh, that you gave us here. Do um, you have any other final thoughts? Uh, no, I think uh, that's, uh, we're here. I, I can't uh, not talk about the expo that we're at. Uh, I've been here uh, maybe since yesterday, but the expo started today. But I just want to <laughs> share with everyone how excited I am to be here. And it, it's been really amazing experience, you know. Um, I have seen big machinery out in the field. I have not seen all the big machinery and all the pipe material all in one single hall where you can you know touch and feel it and watch it so uh, that's that's the that's the value of being here at the expo and the the good thing that the expo did this year was not just have a big exhibit area but also have some educational component and i you know i i, I talked at one of the uh, talks but you know um, just having some educational component help there's a lot of people here at, it's such a such a great place to be at I'm, I'm really excited i'm looking forward to the next two days as well yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that's something I, I didn't get to sit in on your talk here uh, earlier today, but uh, I think you're giving it again tomorrow. So um, hopefully be able to hit that up. And yeah, I'd echo, I'd echo that as well. Um, it's been uh, really rewarding to see, just to have the conversations with a bunch of different people, whether it's, you know, uh, you educators on the research side, getting to share, I mean, your message and your work with um, a lot of the, the vendors here, like our, ourselves with Princeco, um, or just the contractors, you know, a lot of the audience here. So the more information that we can get and the more times that we can get, uh, you know, the the movers and shakers within the industry kind of all together and, and focused on something, it's uh, a lot of work can get done. So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and again, thank you for having me on this podcast. It's it's just an amazing opportunity and I maybe, I, you know, I hope I, I'll get to do this more often, you know, that we can we can literally talk about one, one topic at a time. And yeah, exactly. And that's uh, <laughs> when you mentioned your talk, I, I forgot to even bring that up. Uh, one of the ra main reasons that you're here is to give your speech. So maybe we'll have to bring you back on again to talk through uh, what is it? Why? Why tiling works, I, I think, is the name of the talk. So um, like I said, no, appreciate your time, appreciate uh, and your work that's going on um, within the industry and moving the ball forward on this. So uh, thanks a lot for coming down tonight. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today on The Water Table. You can find us at watertable.ag. Find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. And you can also find the podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms.